and we um, have an office on Penny Lane. Um, at the moment, there's um, two directors, myself and Sue, and we have four architectural staff, one of which is part-time, and we also have um, a part-time admin and um, office manager. Um, and I guess tonight we want to use this as a conversation um, as much as possible. We've got some slides to go through um, to, that outline our approach, but we'd be interested in the discussion that it generates and um, we will use the mirror board. Although at the moment I've got two screens on the go, I don't know if I can see the mirror board at the same time. Um, when we started talking about this lecture between us, we would talk about it in the context of it being the feminist week. Um, and the immediate question was obviously, are we a feminist practice? Um, and although that should be obviously inherent in what, in what we do, we've been trying to articulate and write about this for a while um, as we're conscious that to be in order that in order to be agents for change, that we need to be um, I'd know more visible um, and so we're excited to hear your input today and hopefully that will help us to articulate it better as well. Um, so, so this is us. I'll just moment. say hello. Sorry Sarah I'm here now so you can see me. Right, okay. <laughs> um, we used to be next to each other but we're in separate parts so I can't, can you see me? Yeah, I yeah, can see okay, you. Okay, I can see you. Right. <laughs> um, when we graduated the, the split of, of architects um, by the ARB was a woeful 13% that were female. Um, and I was looking up the ARB report, the, the latest one um, today, just to remind myself that um, although it's still about 30 rather than 13 um, percent, um, a female actually under the last report the gender split of people under 30 was actually 50 50 so there's been some good progress there um in the last 20 years um but obviously there's still a little bit of a way to go um and just to sort of put some context for the lecture itself and um, the 23rd of march 2020 was officially the start of the uk's um first COVID lockdown. Um, it was also actually our 10th birthday as, as a practice. So that kind of got lost in, in that um, swap to, to working from home. But we thought we'd use this lecture to reflect on how the pandemic has helped us reinforce our key values as a practice, um, which have ultimately sustained and interestingly, I suppose for us, actually expanded the business and our number of staff over the last year. Sorry. Um, okay, so what are our values? Go on, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I was just gonna say, um, like we enjoy collaboration and I think um, this is a feminist trait in its own right. So we'll explain, we're gonna explain a bit during the lecture about how and why we practice. Hopefully we think this will throw out some discussion points about why some of these ways of working could be considered feminist. I guess um, inherently and obviously we're, we, we job share Sarah and I. So, we always sort of set out to prove that architectural practice could be family friendly. So in the office, we haven't really got any late night work and culture and um, we wanted to try and prove that we could still run a viable business doing this. And ultimately that's led us to being inclusive on many levels, but it's still, we're still not where we want to be, I suppose. Um, the slide that's on now is just a little snippet of what happened to us when lockdown happened. It was very much us trying to manage between us um, to, to start with um, and I think when we when, a couple of years ago we got we got um, acknowledged as an RAB practice role model um, and one of the quotes from this I think next slide Sarah said flexible inclusive workplaces don't happen by accident they happen by design um, and I guess for us at first we very much got on with it but and and, and ultimately the way we practice is because we couldn't really do it any other way um, the office is outside of the city centre, so we're close to the schools that our kids go to. And then we ended up, once we bought the office, we fitted and we put an Airbnb above our shop, which helps to plug, plug clash flows gaps early on in, in the early days, especially when we were wanting to work on more specific community projects where perhaps funding or fees wouldn't allow us to explore in as much detail as we'd like. Um, but then I guess what happened uh, when lockdown arrived, it sort of brought to the forefront for us what was important. And I think this 
really has evolved for us over the year. It's been quite an exciting year as well as a difficult one. Um, and it's been about like collaborators and climate change in a way. And so the first thing that we wanted to talk about was our colleagues. Um, I think it's important to be open minded and flexible to change. And I guess that's definitely helped us during lockdown. And um, our colleagues really, I guess, the key to any successful business is the people that you work with on a daily basis. Uh, whenever we do a recruitment drive, it's usually pretty obvious immediately the applicants that align with our own interests, but we always seek to add depth to our skill set as a practice with the people that we hire. Um, I don't know if you want to speak a bit more, Sarah, about uh, us and our different skill sets. <laughs> Um, I think, you know, for anybody, to be perfectly honest, I, I had never, you know, I had a, a job um, in, a, in a fairly big commercial practice in, in Liverpool for in the early part of my career. And for a lot of time, I, I didn't really have any aspirations to run my own practice. Um, but one of the things that has become obvious from doing this is that if you do decide to go down that route, it's important to think about who you want to go into practice with. Um, it's no use being in practice with somebody who has got exactly the same skills as you. So, you know, if you're both starters or if you're both finishers, um, it's sort of like management terms and that is is really not going to become a, um, a viable business option. Um, Sue and I are lifelong friends. We've literally known each other since we were three or four. Um, and we have a similar out, outlook on life because we have the same upbringing. Um, but because we had quite different professional experiences earlier on in our, on, in our careers, um, and we can do all of the roles that are required of us, you know, in terms of running a project or running a business, but there are elements of that that play to each of our strengths and um, I'll let you decide what they might be as maybe the thing goes on. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess that um, switching to working from home was, for us is quite seamless um, due to the way that our systems are set up because we've always had kind of WhatsApps and like the staff have been used to us with job sharing and partly working from home and answering questions while we're round and about but um, I guess so so it, it we've always worked off the cloud as well and we both um staff have been used to being sort of working independently and cross over between us sarah and i to discuss projects or que queries it was tested a bit to limit when we first went into lockdown because we were teaching four kids under 10 and you know sarah would be starting at 6 30 in the morning and and then i would be swapping over at four o'clock at night and so on but Anyway, we, we, we made the best of it and I think we found like lots of new technology that's available to us. And sorry, this slide's a bit blurred, but just because it's got client details on. So we used to work off a, like a whiteboard in the office and decide how everybody was working. And we've moved quite quickly to using Miro and other systems that we found really helpful for us. And although we're a bit zoomed out, um, we, we know that that's been a bit of a saviour and we'll definitely be using that more regularly because it's it's streamlined a lot of decision making and meetings for us that, um, you know, and I think that 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 that's something that we've needed to do. Um, some of our staff now work more permanently from home. One of our staff's relocated to the Lake District and they'll do ad hoc days in the office once the restrictions allow. Um, and. Although there's a bit of trial of error, I think that that's fine. And it's ultimately helped us re to recruit the calibre of stuff that we need. Um, I think that's been generally like, acknowledged, not just in architecture, but in other disciplines. I, I think it was nationwide announced today that they're just telling their staff they can just work wherever they want to, whether that's from home, in the office, a bit of both, working in branch. Um, and I think that flexibility has to be acknowledged because that does ultimately um, improve people's um, quality of life. Yeah, so next one, Sarah. Just, yeah, you can, that was just to say, like, we also went, we went out, went sort of marking up physical drawings and in came iPads, digital pencils and all the rest of it. And again, that's been like a really big, like, um, that, you know, that was a really good investment for us. Next one. So just moving on to some of our clients. So I think like everyone has their own moral benchmark against what, which they choose who to work for and the type of project they want. Um, for us to be able to practice the way we want, we don't work with organisations that typically expect long working hours and, and also people who recognise the value of our experience and straight talking. So anyone that wants like freebies or 
demolish listed building and stuff like that won't pass go. Um, and I guess during lockdown, we've had a really steady supply of works and our projects um, are spread out, as, I guess, because our projects are spread out over a number of sectors. Next one. Um, and this is one of the projects that we've been working. So just go to the next one and I can see. Oh, yeah. OK, go back up. Um, so certain projects have continued regardless and they, they're, they're ones that are based around outdoor space. So one of them is this project going Sudley that we've been appointed on. Um, and, and also we've got another similar project that we've also been appointed on in the city, which is a social enterprise. Um, and the unique thing about this is that that's actually my little boy and I came across this space ages ago when I, when I was on maternity leave. And we've been involved with this community client for a long time. Um, they are a therapeutic and nature therapy and wellbeing garden in south of Liverpool. And um, they've been really active during the pandemic and the project that we're working on is to convert an old um, council asset on the, build, uh, on, on the site into a therapy rooms and the profit from the therapy rooms then will go into delivering the free activity for the community in the garden. Just flick through, Sarah. Lots of different activities that we've been involved in, like setting up a forest school, um, outdoor Tai Chi events. Um, there's lots of engagement and consultation involved with the community about asking them what they want to see um, on the site, what activities they want. Um, there's quite a lot of stakeholders in the, in, on the site, so there's National Museums, Liverpool, the City Council, lots of resident groups. Um, and the building that we're working on, which is the one on the bottom right, has got a fairly low budget. And actually one of the things that we've been interested in learning more about, and we've, been, we've all, always been interested in, but we've had opportunity to do more, more research on during lockdown, is around like the circular economy and the use of different materials and tester materials. And I don't know if anyone's been listening to any of the ACON lectures, but they've been really good, I think, in, in, in promoting that. So we're, at the moment, we're looking at a biodiverse roof on here, and we're looking at using mycelium as an insulation material. Um, and I guess one of the things that we do with our staff is let them um, give them freedom to um, take risks and experiment within a managed way. So um, that happens on quite a lot of projects. And I think that's important in order to be able to push new technologies and challenge things that are happening. So especially with around climate. So during lockdown, one of our um, staff qualified as a passive house designer um, We've got other people that are looking into past 2035 and so on. So that uh, embodied um, energy calculations going on. So I think that's going to be something that's going to be really important for us and quite a lot of the clients that are we're working with. Um, OK, next one. Oh, that's just the existing building at the moment. So we've got uh, uh, quite a few things going on. So this is just a little timeline that shows some of the stuff that, that we're in, that's that been going on in it. So with a, any community projects, I think that um, you have to be involved from the beginning and it takes a long time to come to any kind of gestation. So this one has been going on for, I would say, 10 years now um, that we've been doing it. So, it, you know, we're quite excited that it's finally going to be on site. Okay. Next one is just a guest, a guest to talk a little bit about collaboration. And one of the other things that we've been interested in is procurement and whether the current method of procurement works and, and how we can explore new methods of, of, of procuring things when it's appropriate. So um, this is just a selection of projects that have, we've been working on or that are happening on site at the moment. Um, we have a builder that we work with regularly who um, knows as well. <laughs> and um, I guess we quite we quite often send people to site that work with him. So we've got, it's almost like a design and build contract. So we've got new methods that we're um, working on in order to do some of our household projects. And that's worked quite well. I don't know if you want to say a bit more about that, Sarah, to do the residential before I speak specifically about quarry. Yeah, sure. Um, the you know, the, the way that we have our the residential projects in our 
office is, has become far more streamlined in terms of the earlier design um, processes. But in terms of, of getting it to site, we do still do um, the traditional way of getting, um, you know, three tenders and managing that for people who, who need it. Some people just go and find the, the builders themselves, obviously. Um, but when we're working with our own builder, um, we have a slightly different role and one of the things we're just trying to grapple with really is, is kind of what to call that. Um, those of you who haven't already, you will, um, as part of your studies, learn about contracts and um, the um, the sort of you know, the sort of the, the, the normal way of kind of going about procuring a building. Um, and because we've got so much experience, we can kind of see the pros and cons of that now um, and sort of sometimes taking that apart and putting it back together in a different way ultimately to make it more better value for our, our clients um, is something that we've been doing and that involves us rather than you know just acting as what's normally called as the contract administrator on site we are almost like the project manager and also acting on behalf of the of the contractor in terms of um, ordering materials and skips and things so it becomes a very much more integrated um, process be between us um, and that has resulted in some, some nice projects. Yeah so the other collaboration is that we we were looking to kind of get into doing slightly bigger projects and the way that the procurement system is set up for architects at the moment quite often you've got to bid for projects and um, you've got to have minimum turnover or minimum number of staff and there's been quite a lot in the press written about this recently about how it um, it kind of stifles creative small practices to get involved and I think that's changing quite a lot but one thing that we've um, done this year is we've been invited by a number of larger practices to be part of their team so one we've we did a we won a competition with um, Micah for the Museum of Liverpool that we're working on at the moment and that's in itself is like an interesting new way of working that we think is the way forward so um, I'm involved in quite a lot like Guerrilla Tactics which is a really good small practice conference down in London um, I think being involved in in those kind of things is the best way to be an agent for change, I suppose. Um, and then the last project we've just got a few slides on is just one that completed on site while we've been during lockdown. Or during lockdown. So this was a, um, an existing 1960s house that had been knocked about and altered quite a lot. Um, and we did an initial feasibility for the client about different massing you know, I'm not going to go into loads of detail about this because it's probably a whole separate lecture. I guess the point of sharing it is um, that we got to use some new materials and it was quite an interesting, um, it's been quite an interesting learning curve for people in our office and also for us in terms of like developing relationships with clients and also learning about how, you know, how, how we can push to use new materials on site. Um, and we haven't got full photographs of the building yet but when 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 we do um hopefully we can share it in a bit more detail but the next page is sort of where it's up to so what happened was that instead of we, we instead of demolishing the whole building we tried to reuse as much of what was there um there was quite a lot of um discussion around from a cost point of view whether if you because if you build a house from new at the moment there's no VAT charged on that but if you use an existing building you do have to pay back the VAT on it but we did quite a lot of calculations to prove that we still thought it was worthwhile keeping the existing building and actually we, we think from a kind of climate point of view the best building is the one that already exists so I'm just going to open another document um because I've got a few figures on that, there won't be a second. So the, the images you can see here are um, a couple of the materials that we've used. The, the brick is a Beinerberger brick that is the first time it's been used in the UK. Um, and it's unusual because you don't point it up, it's laid in a different way to normal. Yeah, um, so it uses like between 50 and 70 percent less mold than a typical brook brick construction because of the way it's been pointed and although it's ne it never been used in the UK before we still um, work with a local bricky um, and spent time on site to build a sample panel and test the construction before it started um, and also the like 
cut the value of the project was quite low for the for the for the um, square meterage. So one of the main things is what we were going to do with quite the, quite a large reef area, um, and and we picked um, this product which is um, a fibre cement board. It's Marley Turner and they're large format format lightweight because the upper part of the bit we had to work off the existing foundation so the upper part of the building is a timber frame um, and there's quite it's usually traditionally used in agricultural buildings but actually there's quite a lot of um, benefits in this scenario as well so it's got acoustic dampening um, so basically when it rains you can't hear the rain going through because I think they've developed that because it's usually used in sheds where there's animals and so on and it's got good thermal properties as well rust and corrosion free you can kind of um you can sort of paint it up you don't have to replace it in the same way that you would with a metal roof um we reused all the existing slab the main walls at the ground floor of of, of um, reduced the initial groundwork so actually the footprint of the building reduced significantly from what it was originally which meant the client got a much bigger garden but they didn't lose any of the amount of accommodation in the building because it's now stacked over three floors rather than it being all spread out which made it a lot more efficient in terms of heating it um, and ventilation and so on. Uh, the larch on the outside is FSC larch cladding um, and all the existing fabric is underneath. So I mean there's loads of other facts about it which I don't think it's worth discussing now because it was just more to tell you I suppose about this idea of us trying to um, try out new materials and use things that haven't been perhaps used before and I think um, there's an opportunity to do that more for architects now with the um, R&D initiative that we use quite a lot that's been really useful for us to do this. And then I think the black, we have got some more things that we can share about other projects, but I think that's probably enough for now if anyone has got any questions. I've got, there's a couple of things here about climate change. So um, we were involved in the climate strike, everybody in the office. We've always sort of done this circular economy thing. So I think the last slide is just describes how our office fits within our community. So um, we, we, we chose to be in a shop front so that we could animate and show people what architects do. And then obviously above there, we've, we're on Penny Lane, so it's perfect for something like an Airbnb and Liverpool's become a big tourist destination. And the money that we get off that helps us to um, do some of the more community lab projects that we want to work on. The local independents that are nearby that we also do quite a lot for work for supply some of the things in our Airbnb and actually what's not on this diagram is just down the road we've just got a new project that's like literally 200 meters away which is a listed church that we're working on at the moment um, for a community group and I think generally most of our projects are in with with a couple of mile radius aren't they Sarah? Yeah, yeah. Two or three mile radius? Yeah. I mean, we do go travel further than that. When we set up, we were adamant that, you know, we, we wouldn't travel more than about two hours um, if we had a project, because that's, you know, if you're running something on site and you've got to go and do a site visit, then that's just about doable, traveling there, doing your meeting and getting back within a day. Um, it also obviously um, helps in terms of environmental impact. Um, and we do have a few that are, are on the boundaries of that um, up in, in the Lake District and over um, on the East Coast currently and over in North Wales. But the vast majority are within within Merseyside, yes. And I think that also helps you be able to be sort of relevant to the clients that you're working for. So we've got part of the reason why we've got the collaboration with the large architect, architects practices is due to our sort of local knowledge and input and kind of understanding what our community and um, city is about. So I guess the last slide, the last slide is the last one really just about to stay relevant. So um, yeah, go up Sarah. So that, that's not, that's the last okay. one. Sorry. I've got, I've got some more about Park Palace, but I've spoken about that before. I think most people know us for that project, which is a, a horse riding school. So if anyone wants to know about it, we can tell you, but I think that's where we're up to really. That's where our question is, like, how do you stay relevant? And um, for us, it's like encouraging people to always do, like continue professional development and learn new things and being given chance within the office to, to I guess, explore things that they're interested in. 
and see what they can bring to the office and how we can learn from each other. And it's we're very much collaborative, whether that's with our colleagues or with our clients or with the contractor on site. We're not very, we're not, we don't really go out there and sort of do a big market employ about us, I suppose. It, it's, it's not, it's just not something that comes naturally to us. And I think we just have this attitude that it's better to get on with it. But I think we're starting to recognise from a feminist perspective that maybe, um, you know, if you need, if you want to be an agent for change, you've got to do a bit more of that so that it encourages other people. And I know last year we did do a few lectures and we got really positive feedback and it's good to stay in touch with people and, and encourage other people, like people that have come to work for us that have moved to London and so on. They all stay in touch. They're mainly female, but that's not not intentional. <laughs> I think it's just the, the way that it's worked out. So we hope that some of those people will go on to set up their own practice and feel like it's not impossible, which I personally think we probably would have felt it was if we didn't have each other to work with. Um, so yeah, I guess that's it really. If anyone's got any questions. I will pop the link to the mirror board in the chat as well if anyone's got any, um, if anyone wants to share their questions. But I think, yeah, thank you so much. I I certainly enjoyed that. Um, and that, yeah, really engaging lecture there. Um, I think it's just refreshing seeing, you know, a female-led northern firm, you know, and I think that's a question that I have you guys you know um it's pretty rare to have a female lab like northern Beta, especially you know liverpool i think why why do you think that is and do we need more <laughs> <laughs> yeah that would be good i was having a, a little bit of a geek out this morning um in advance of this just looking back at the riba benchmarking survey which for those who don't know is probably like the biggest pain to do every year but is useful for the information that it spews out um and that sort of lists out you know by region by size of practice um the number of people who are in senior positions and, and all the other different um areas of, of becoming an architect um in terms of, of gender and you know really it's not shifted that much i wouldn't say um the last the earliest one i could get hold of was 2015 and the numbers have crept up a little bit but not by very much um and what i have been campaigning for is for them to ask the question because it's not asked um, when they do the benchmarking you know is your practice solely female-led or you know what's the proportion of people who who are you know the principals in your practice that are female or not um and i think when we first start, start, set up um we got a little bit of um, a grant from what was um train 2000 which now liverpool visions been various other things um and that was the first time we'd done a business plan and I just remember at the time, like the, the examples that Sue was kind of bringing to the table, you know, there, was, there was nobody that we were trying to like be in, in the Northwest. Um, it was all like London based practices where they were, where the, where the prevalence of female led practices were, were was higher. Um, and that, you know, that is slowly starting to change. And it's, and it's very welcome to see that there's more people at least talking about it. I don't know if the walk walk in the walk but certainly talking about it more yeah. than, uh, than maybe 20 years ago i think i think also what we've realized on a more serious note is that the culture of um like our it's not really for us just about like um more women in architecture it's more diversity and people from different backgrounds and walks of life because i think that you need people from all walks of life to design the buildings because ultimately everybody from all walks of life is using them and um and i think that you know, part of the cultural problem is, and it's still prevalent in schools of architecture, and I don't really know how this can be changed without a lot of work, is the um, late night working and uh, and this sort of attitude that you've got to just keep going and keep going and keep going. And actually, when we were interviewing um, for a position quite recently, we ended up choosing somebody 
who so we had a re some really good candidates but one of them particularly was sort of talking to us about how much work they'd done in in their in their group and i think it was good that they'd done this collaborative work in their group but they'd had to work all hours to produce it which was you know when i was at university i used to work in groups with with my peers and i had to hold down a job in the evening and so i always felt bad when i had to go and do my job because i couldn't carry on contributing to the discussion and for us, we need people that can work efficiently and that know how to, you know, do, do what's needed during the day. Because if you're a parent and you've got to pick a child up from school or nursery, it doesn't like just stay open till 11 o'clock at night when you finish procrastinating over what you can do. And, and I think the other issue is as well that there's been a lot written now. I was reading an article in the AJ today about some practices, not all obviously, but there are some still some practices that are like, exploiting part one and part two students who are obviously have got more opportunity to work late and they want to sort of prove themselves and i think you've really got to fight against that because otherwise it, it it you know it's good to be able to want to get the experience but actually it does lead to a culture whereby it makes it less inclusive for certain people to um join the profession um so like when we're doing fee proposal, we don't, we rarely really do competitions um, unless we're invited or a part of a team where we don't have to get that involved in what we need to contribute <laughs> um, because we learned a lesson from that and that's how we ended up doing the Grown Sudby project because we just thought it was better to do a self-initiated one than to spend loads of time on doing free work. Um, but I think all of that is why there aren't as many people from different backgrounds in in architecture and I hope that that will change and I think it definitely is and I think that the um now that there's different ways of working and people have got used to working from home and using zoom to do meetings there's a shift from 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 there's a lot more flexibility about where you can work from which I think will also help yeah and I think just adding on to that in terms of architectural education as well the sheer length of the degree and you know the the, the demand that we you know the work that we need to put in that automatically excludes people uh young people who may be carers or you know have to are from disadvantaged backgrounds who need a part-time job on the side it's just completely unsustainable so then you end up getting this kind of cohort of architects that don't necessarily have the responsibilities of you know being a mother having to take your kids to school every morning and pick them up at three o'clock yeah. so i think you know that kind of shift in practice is really important and really really valid um so i, I think maria's got a question maria would you like to um ask uh turn your mic on and and ask or i can yeah yeah i can do that can you hear me hi. yeah you're good hi um i was wanting to ask you guys and um, with the experience you have now um what sort of advice would you give to yourself or other female graduates in regards to promoting yourself when it comes to trying to make your way in the industry and um, as I've been doing lots of readings lately and it's just crazy and um, like the numbers with like how many female grads won't go for jobs unless they are the perfect applicant and meet every role description whereas it's been shown that male com counterparts will often kind of go for those jobs anyway if they don't completely kind of fit it um, and I feel like that sort of mindset perhaps affects you know how you go like what um what advice would you have in regards to tackling those sorts of like barriers both our own barriers but also just barriers in the industry well one of the things that we always say to everyone in the office is that like learn something new every day or like take something from every project because that's what we do and i don't think you should enter into um a job thinking that you're expected to know everything because you're not and a lot of it is around attitude and how you get on with your colleagues and how you can communicate with different people and for us that's as important as anything um and and i think that i definitely i i think both sarah and i like you you always want to do it perfectly and it's really annoying if something goes wrong and you can't you know but i think you've got to change your mindset into thinking that design is iterative and so is learn so things evolve and, and move on all the time and as long as you can accept when something's gone wrong you shouldn't be scared of making a mistake because that's how you learn um and that's what we encourage our staff to do anyway and I, th I think from like turning it on its head it's also about 
people who are advertising the jobs, making sure that the advert is worded so that it could appeal to as many different people as possible or being advertised in places where um, other people might 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 look for it um and you know we we did a, rec a recruitment well we've been, hired two people over over lockdown but the last one we, we were looking for an architect you know we, we tried you know we're not perfect <laughs> but we tried to run it past a broader selection of people than perhaps we would have done um previously and it's just making sure that the language is right i think um to encourage people to to, to like you know start start the conversation thank you okay there's um there's a question on the mirror board which um is saying who are your clients and how do you sell your practice as a female architect um that phrase i think we you know we struggle with a little bit um like what what you know how do you distinguish yourself because we are female and we do think potentially differently um, without kind of giving yourself a label as a female architect, you know, because we're all just architects. It just happens to be that we're women. Um, and I think earlier on in our practice, we, you know, we, we sort of struggled with whether that was um, a hindrance or a help to sort of put it out there. Um, I'm not entirely sure I have the exact answer to um to that one but in terms we of you know, we don't really go for jobs and say oh we're a female yeah, architect. i think exactly. we just i think we've just been we've stuck to our ethics and morals about the type of jobs that jobs that we want to work on and we've been quite for well we've been quite fortunate i guess or that we or maybe it's through us working hard and doing good jobs for people mm -hmm. that we get a lot of repeat clients and we get a lot of referrals so it's it's if like literally all the clients that we work for now we would like we we enjoy the working relationship with them it's not difficult and we, i just don't think if we get somebody that comes to us that we don't think we are the best fit for we would be honest with them and say we we don't think that you know we'd be honest with them we send a brochure at the beginning that sets out how we approach projects and i think people appreciate that honesty because actually a lot of lay people don't really know the difference between different types of architect they just think it's sort of like a, a, a job that it's the same <laughs> um so I, we don't go out and like go for jobs saying we're a female architect it's more based on our experience and our kind of approach and our morals and how we go about developing projects that we we talk about i would say mm -hmm. um uh, do you want to ask your question yeah, just um, on that note, so again, may maybe not putting this label of being a female at practice, but how do you feel about like hiring people and being hired by people? Is there like a difference, a shift in mentality or do you feel something's different? Do you mean like, uh, so, so what do you mean? So like if we're our attitude to how we go about hiring people? Yeah. How we, how we go about hiring people and then um, yeah it's always been you know finding the best person to fit to fit that role um you know our approaches to recruitment might have changed a little bit over time and sometimes it's you know somebody that you know and it's a direct approach and sometimes we've 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 advertised um but i think we've always sought to find the person who is the best fit for the job at that point in time yeah and no. actually yeah and actually that person might not be the same so whoever we need to hire now it might mm. not be the same job description next year because what we tend to do is look at the skill set within the office and and we do quite a lot of um work on so rather than having like appraisals once a year where everybody sits down and we say how's it going we have like more informal catch-ups with people all year so if anyone's worried about something or something is not quite gone how they're expected they feel like they can voice concerns and it doesn't just sort of build up and build up and so like open communication with our staff is really important and we also um we've just um signed up for doing a bit of like profiling so um recognizing that everybody's got different skill sets and actually not everybody is in working for us for the same reasons like some people might salary might be more important than 
work-life balance or um, how close we are to the city centre or the kinds of clients that we've got. And we, we do ask those questions and I think it's quite important to get a picture of what people enjoy about their job, um, what their skills are and then what complements that rather than everybody having the same skill set. Um, and then your question about how do we, um, how is it for, what did you say, like how is it for when we speak to clients? Yeah. It's, I think a lot of what we do is listen. So we do um, our briefing workshops are usually quite extensive. And the first part is just like people offloading and listening. And then after that, we sort of start to filter down and what their brief is so that we can re reiterate back to them. And if, I didn't realise, but somebody who's just joined us said that's quite a unique thing and not something they've experienced before in practice. But I guess for us, it's really important that people think that we are, that it's their project and they've got ownership over it. So we don't like impose a house style or a house approach. It's very much geared towards what each project or client or personality needs. And the way that we do that is through our like, listening at the beginning and taking their briefing notes and that, that i think that was exemplified just this week really and um, had somebody ring up and they've got um a site that they want to redevelop in a conservation area in this in a town center and you know i spoke to her a couple of times and sort of it's quite complicated because she's not too sure what she's going to do with the business and does she want to develop it herself or is she going to redevelop part of it and it all sort of tied into her own life plans as well as what the what was physically possible on the site and I put forward a proposal and she rang up and she said you were the only one who like who got it like because I'd listened not just to the you know I didn't just say to her well, what do you want on the site you know, she doesn't know, does she? She just she doesn't know what planning policy is. Um, but what she did know was which direction she didn't know which direction a business is going to go in in the next five to ten years, and she needed to help somebody to help her plan that out. So it, you know, your skill there isn't about the fact that you can design the best housing or retail unit that should go on the site. It's the fact that you're strategically reviewing what this person needs to yes release the value of the site, but equally solve all of their potential life questions that they've got floating around in the head and trying to nail them down in some sort of concrete way um, and and sort of like disseminate all of this stuff that's going around in their head and you know it always still amazes me that that people that some people just don't get that so if it's not their architects because I just think yeah. how can you solve a problem creatively unless you're looking at it in the round. So when we when I was at Sheffield it was a presume it's the same now I can see Russell's asking a question so he must be similar because he's still there so um whether it was all very much about process and I think that is really important like pro like having the process is as important as the products and that's definitely the case when you're working with a client because it's iterative and so all the things that you're doing in Sheffield are definitely we've have, have always been like drivers for how we go about our practice so Russell asked, how do you think being based in a shop affects communities and clients' perception of your practice? Do people often wonder in? <laughs> so we oh, set yeah. up in a shop front, front so that like people could see what architects do. And we've got a window. It's, I don't know if you can see it where I'm. Can you see it in the background where I'm sat? Right, yeah, there, yeah. yeah. So we've got like a shop window where we, at the moment we've got something on about International Women's, Women's Day, but we often write on the window. Uh, little rants about different things register to vote we had up once we've got loads of different ones we do get people wandering in but i think people are kind of familiar with us now and it's definitely been an, a free advertisement being here mm. um sean who's, who's our newest recruit and um so newest to the whole hsa experience today she, i think she's had a day when when everybody kind of came in you know, I think there's somebody waiting to get his bag of chips down the road. Thought he'd just have a little wander, and he's been like, oh, "What do you do in here?" She was like, "Well, it's a bit of a big question to answer, really." <laughs> um, but you know, we do okay because we're on Penny Lane. We do occasionally get people coming in and asking us for directions to John Lennon's house, or thinking that they're on Abbey Road um, and trying to recreate that whole. And <laughs> um, you know, it can be quite random. <laughs> And pre-COVID, we would kind of encourage that, really, because ultimately we're trying to demystify what people do. Um, but, you know, yeah. there's a response to that. <laughs> yeah. 
So we've got like um, we have little models in the window and stuff, and there's a school nearby, and quite often little kids will walk past, and the mums outside or the dads are explaining to them about what 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 it is, and it doesn't say architecture on the outside, but some I think most people locally know, don't they know? <laughs> All sounds very good. <laughs> Does anyone it else makes a change to being than being in an office locked away when you can't see what's going on, doesn't it? Yeah, and I guess it's very different from like the arts tower culture where we're effectively suspended, you know, looking over the whole city from like a bird's eye view. I think it's very interesting that dynamic going from that to then having a direct relationship with the streets, almost going from like plan view in the arts tower to then section yeah I think <laughs> we definitely feel much more at home in the office to be honest I feel like more on a par here <laughs> yeah because it's a pretty sorry go on no you're right go on. it's a pretty small space I guess as well like I mean could you see yourself kind of upsizing to maybe <laughs> uh, would you yeah. dare to head to the city centre <laughs> Yeah, there's a whole other load of discussion in pandemic that's gone on around like business direction. So we've always like obviously we bought and developed the office and the um, builder that I talked about before is my partner. So we do like loads of small developments informally together and, it, you know, that learn learning from him and building generally is something we're kind of interested in and we're we're ready we we are in a conundrum about whether we want to grow any bigger or whether we can just all about fit in as we are at the moment but obviously some people are working from home and one of our, our members of staff is going to be working remotely for for the unforeseeable future so we can hot desk and share in that way so i don't know I think if an opportunity came up, we would consider moving and having a slightly bigger space, but I'm not sure that we would, we'd probably just do something slightly different with here. Like we might just do something that concentrated on ha homes, like so two parts of the business. I don't know, we're always thinking about this, Sarah. Yeah. That's why Miro's come in handy because we can draw all these lines around ideas and cast things off that don't work. <laughs> Bring them back if they do. <laughs> that's great so do you think i guess as you said like with um kind of covid making you know practices like reevaluate lots of things do you think maybe you know this whole like london centric obsession with you know if you want to make it big as an architect you go to london i think that's quite a big thing there's kind of like pressure to end up in london do you think since covid and the kind of more uh the flexibility in terms of being able to work from home do you think we'll see more smaller practices popping up um around outside yeah. of London? yeah i mean i already know loads of people that are doing not dissimilar stuff to us and i think um like i sit in a few different groups where i'm really excited about these small practices and i, I know um the, the new um, architect, new architects for is it the architecture foundation one that just came out? There's like loads of them in there, isn't there? Um, and I think um, I think a lot of the time you just don't necessarily have time to to tell people about yourself in the same way if you're busy getting on with it. And um, a lot of people during <coughs> lockdown have had a bit more time to do that, so perhaps get their websites up to date and come out of the woodwork a little bit more. So hopefully there is a whole little network of people doing things that are interesting that maybe you don't quite know about in the main architectural press yet that will become more um, prevalent just because I think some of the stuff that they're looking at and we're looking at is becoming more fashionable, I suppose, a bit as a result of lockdown. You know, I don't and, know, and, you know, right, know what I mean. Yeah, neither of us went to London. You know, we got our early career experience in here in, in Liverpool. So I guess we're proof that, you know, we that can be can be possible. I think the thing to counter balance that, even though we've got some staff working partially remotely, the the um nothing can beat like being in the office and having a roundtable discussion about design and 
we've got the office set up so that Sue and I uh, are in occasionally and we've got one member of staffing but everybody else is still working from home and um, but at least because we're there we've got the meeting um, space people you know our staff members can come in and we can like talk things through and it's, it's so much more rewarding um to be able to do that rather than trying to do it via a screen so i think there's still a balance there to be had and you know the, the member of staff who's who's now based up in the lake district you know she still wants to come to the office because occasionally when when we're, she's allowed to because she recognizes that that still needs to take place for um the de for designs to happen not necessarily faster but um you know more collaboratively between us all yeah yeah i think we've all found that in studio as well like studio culture studio environment i think one thing a lot of us have realized you don't necessarily appreciate just how much you learn from your peers mm. yeah. um so as soon as you're kind of removed from that day-to-day -day interaction it's a big difference it makes a massive difference yeah yeah definitely and you know one of our staff is currently doing her part three um, and unfortunately, you know, she'd been working for us for over a year before lockdown hit. So she understood you know, how we generally go about things and how we communicate with our clients and our um, consultants. But ultimately, um, she, um, you know, she's been having to do all her studies remotely. And I think, um, you know, that I, that's kind of we've obviously worked out ways to kind of address that whilst she is remotely but it is it's not ideal just being able to like listen in with people you learn so much more <laughs> yeah, sure. i'm just looking at the question <laughs> what do you wish you'd learned in really. um, so yeah what, what do you wish you'd learned while in architecture school that doesn't necessarily mean sheffield you could talk about schools generally or um uh, or liverpool um yes that's true it's it's quite a difficult question to answer because i think in hindsight you can see the benefit of some of the things that you were taught and it's only through the hindsight of experience that you can see that so in a way i appreciate everything that i learned while i was at architecture school i'm not sure that i would necessarily change it it's just that i would do it differently if i was going to go about doing it again because then i'd have the benefit of experience so i guess it's that i idea of like get getting into a habit of being more productive and working like a nine to five day and, and understanding how that fits into, um, like, I think people see running a business as, as, as not a creative thing, but actually it is. So there's lots of creativity and 3D problem solving that goes into actually running a business. Um, and you don't really learn any of that until you actually start. So. I think a lot of people start out, don't they, in practice, not necessarily intentionally because they might win a little competition or get made redundant or life sort of forces the hand. And um, I think it might, we probably did have lectures on this stuff, but because you, you don't really realise until you're in practice what it is that you were learning about retrospectively, I suppose. Yeah, I think like the, the business of architecture is something that I think is addressed more now. You know it, it seems to become more integral to the way that people are taught their part three so i'm part three examiner so i can kind of see you know what levels people have come at, at depending on maybe which school they've they've gone to um i mean sue and i are old enough to be on that that generation that was the cusp of hand drawing and um and computers so you know we went into practice not knowing how to open Photoshop probably. So um and only having had in, we had like a we had a session, didn't we, I think, in the last semester of like, and this is minicad. And um that was Yeah. yeah was and we still a, use back to work. We're on back to works now, so it's yeah. uh it's good. I think I think um like now I mean, I teach occasionally at Liverpool John Moores, which I, I found in second year, I kind of enjoyed, I really enjoyed that because um, there's lots of people from different walks of life and it was really interested in, in, in seeing how they all develop over the year. And um, there's still quite a lot of model making and hand drawing that goes on. But one thing that's different is that not everybody has a desk in the studio. So what, 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 where you were talking about the studio culture that you're missing, 
I think that that is the slight disadvantage of computers. So you don't, I, bet, I don't know what it's like now, but do as, do as many people work in the studio or is there more people that work from home? So I think you don't, like people recognising that you learn a lot from being around other people in the studio is important. And I think that there's a tendency for, with the technology that you can just get into just being on your own working, which isn't really reflective of what happens in practice. What is the split now? Before COVID, we were really trying to encourage uh, increased studio use. And there was, uh, what we have had to do because student numbers have increased so much in recent years is that um, first year and second year, hot desk on different days of the week in the same studio. Yeah. But we're starting to realise that as a school of architecture outside London, where we we have got more space, uh, we should really be trying to uh, offer um, studio space to all students. Yeah. So that was sort of part of our negotiations with the states before um, COVID hit. Yeah, and I think people now, um, my peers and myself included, um, being subjected to kind of your small desk in your bedroom, it makes it a lot easier to do more digital work because it's all on the one screen rather than a big A1 drawing board, which is pretty tricky in these students. <laughs> yes, we've all been there looking for yeah. A1 boards, you know, <laughs> yeah. to the top. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, there's a there's a, a, um, a question on the Miro board that I feel as if we need to address. So, um, <laughs> as um, your practice is clearly climate conscious and are in touch with the circular economy, etc., how did you decide to use a brick that isn't in the UK in terms of transportation costs? <laughs> <laughs> I don't well, want to ignore it. So. <laughs> so yeah, I mean that at the time that it's only really come that we had that client wanted a specific type of look for that building and they did want it to be made out of stone. So it was quite tricky to find something that met her brief. So and in a way so say that again and that would yeah. So it 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 what it's a happy coincidence that we ended up with a brick that had um had lots of pluses that we that, that that we could that were brought to the projects in but there is no denying that there was a cost benefit to it as well because they were in Vineberg were interested in using it in the UK um, and I guess like the system of building it was supposed to be quicker and time on site and things like that so there's quite a lot of things we've learned from using it but you're welcome um, to have half off with your salad if you wanted it <laughs> <laughs> I saw your mics on <laughs> <laughs> so who, who is it that asked the question um it's just on the mirror board i'm afraid it doesn't that, oh, yeah. that was like me yeah <laughs> yeah yeah I, I mean we, we we do try to use uk products i mean generally what we've been doing through this lockdown as well is so katie's done her passive house course and mike's been looking at like past 25 2035 and we've just generally been really interested in re like reusing um, stuff on site and how you can go about like you sort of need the facts and figures to go with it. And that's difficult to do. Sometimes it's just on uh, like you kind of instinctively know that that would make more sense, but um, it's hard to get stuff tested that you're reusing. Um, and like when you come to specify it, like proving that it's got all the right credentials that you can then, you know, hold liability for it. So all of that stuff is part of what we're learning. I guess next time if we came to want to use a brick like that again, we'd probably approach a UK manufacturer maybe and ask them if they can produce it, but there aren't any that wanted to do it like that. So whether it'll become more prevalent in the UK, I don't know. And that project's been in the office for quite a long time. So it was specified quite a long time before lockdown, which we probably about three years before. <laughs> Yeah, I was saying to Sarah before you joined, because I live around the corner, it's been really nice being able to walk past um, and oh, see yeah. the project about it. <laughs> oh, really? No, it's, yeah, don't mention any, 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 give any site names away because it's all <laughs> client confidentiality. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, um, it was quite a tricky project, so 
we, we need to do a little bit more. We, it's not really quite finished, so we need to get some good photographs and um, a little bit more information about how what 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 decisions were taken and why. I think would be interesting to show. Yeah, no, it's a great project though. I was just playing devil's advocate, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. Can't shy away from the awkward questions. <laughs> So, sorry about the domestic kind of... intrusion earlier, but um, <laughs> you have uh, the, question, the question I was going to ask is, if this, if with this brick you can use so much less mortar, does that mean the brick becomes more reusable at the end of the life of this building? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think so. And I think this is, um, it, yeah, it definitely, will. it definitely will. I mean, the thing was, um, like the technical advice that we got, got wasn't perhaps as forthcoming as we needed it to be through the project. So there was a little bit of trial and error with it. And um, it, it, it acts like a rain screen, I suppose, for the upper part of the building. But it's got like, it, we ended up having to have like more wall ties than we uh, than they told us that we would because there's not as much mortar. Um, like that was just something that the engineer tied. So that sort of was a bit disappointing because obviously that increased the amount of metal that was in the walls and so on but we've got a whole like embodied energy calculation that we're sort of interested in doing on it i mean the client on that job wasn't it wasn't a particular um driver for her to do with climate it's just it, it, it it's just that we felt that it was the most appropriate solution for the site and it happened to be also reusing the building it, the, the building was actually originally designed by quite a well-known local architect, um, but it had been hacked around a lot and it was at the end of its life in terms of the, um, like there was the, the insulation in the roof, uh, it was sort of falling apart, part of it, so it needed to be replaced anyway. Um, but I think the key thing was that we didn't like extract or take off site any of the slab. So I think literally there was probably only about three meters square or five meters square of additional um slab that um we put in place so the, quite a lot of the all the ground floor i think the walls are reused and then the upper floor is a timber frame we looked at using sits and off-site manufacturing but it's quite a heavily um there's loads of trees on the site so you couldn't get a um a, a, you know you couldn't get a delivery vehicle in to be able to deliver to it so it had to be um constructed on site but it's still fairly quick to do. Um, I could talk in more detail about it to somebody not on YouTube, probably, <laughs> about the things that we did and happened on it. But I Is guess the amount, uh, I don't know what the I don't know what the overall um, pros and cons will be at the end. Um, I think we're interested to see because then that will help us for next time we do a project like that to think about it I mean to be honest like mo the other thing with you were talking about practices outside London and 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 I think the diff the main difference is that around the country for building is that um like land value costs so it doesn't the labor costs and the, the material costs are no different wherever you are but a labor might differ slightly but the amount that somebody can spend on a house of that size in London compared to Liverpool is completely different so the challenges of getting that to work becomes even more creative because literally all of our projects are usually low budget and I think that thinking creatively about reusing materials and how you can solve problems in a way we quite enjoy that because it makes you think harder whereas if you just had access to any product that you wanted because the budget was limitless um, it's not as, I don't know, it's not as creative a process. Like, I don't think we have any projects that don't have some kind of, I don't know what we would do. We have been <laughs> do. So, so, so don't have got loads of money, do whatever you want. <laughs> that would be the most difficult thing. Does anyone have any more questions at all? Or, I mean, we've overrun slightly, so. Um, if no, I guess if no one's got any last pointers, I guess, yeah, thank you for joining us this evening. It's been, re it, I've really enjoyed it. It's been so lovely having you guys here and um, being part of Fem Week as well. It's been, you know, really, really fun, exciting week, really busy.
so um and thanks to everyone for like continuing to engage in the week